So the next topic is water and the role of water in human beings. 60 to 70 percent of our body weight is water. So when you think about water, it's the most common substance, the most abundant molecule in our body is water. And it serves as an excellent cushion. It serves as a great solvent for the chemical reactions of metabolism. It serves as a temperature stabilizer. Water is, a, is an essential molecule in our body. And again, 60 to 70 percent of our body weight is simply water. So it's a, it's a very important molecule. And acids and bases are special solutions that react differently when um, dissolved in water. For example, acids release hydrogen ions in water. So if I take any substance that when I dissolve it in water, there's an excess number of hydrogen ions, that's an acid. So for example, hydrochloric acid, or HCl, is an example of, a, of an acid. It releases hydrogen ions in, in water. If I look at high, uh, sulfuric acid, which is H2SO4, that too releases hydrogen ions in solution. So when we look at acids, they typically begin with the letter H. So they're pretty easy to identify when you look at them in their chemical formulas. You look for that H as the first letter in that molecule or in that compound. Bases, on the other hand, release hydroxide ions in water, which are negatively charged, which will bind up the excess hydrogen ion in solution, which causes a change in pH. Both of these cause changes in pH, but hydrogen ions lower the pH, where hydroxide ions raise the pH. So acids have a pH less than 7, and bases have a pH greater than 7. A pH exactly equal to 7 <coughs> is water, because when I look at water in solution, it breaks up into an equal number of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. <coughs> because they're equal, water is neither an acid or a base, it's a neutral solution. So when we look at the value of pH, it just tells us about the concentration of hydrogen ions in solution. So if it's an acid, there's going to be a greater number of hydrogen ions compared to hydroxide ions. And the lower the pH, the more hydrogen ions are present, and the greater the concentration or the greater the acidity of that solution. And the higher the pH is, the more basic that solution is, and the fewer number of hydrogen ions in that solution, and the more hydroxide ions we'll see in that solution. And there's other ions that are contributing to a higher pH as well, and one of those is bicarbonate ion. And we'll talk about that a little later in the semester when it comes to the respiratory system. So looking at the pH scale again, it ranges from zero, which is very acidic, like battery acid, all the way up to 14, which is very basic, like some of our familiar cleaners, oven cleaner, household ammonia. Bases are typically bitter and slippery, where acids are corrosive and sour in taste. So we can see human urine is slightly acidic. That prevents bacterial growth in the urinary tract. Human blood, on the other hand, is slightly basic. So that is slightly over seven. So <coughs> again, seven is neutral. Anything less than 7 is acidic. Anything greater than 7 is basic. So looking at the molecules that make up So next we're going to talk about the major molecules of life. These are organic molecules, which means they all contain carbon, lots of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, and are arranged in specific ways. They're bonded together with covalent bonds, but their arrangement of those atoms of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, as well as some extra um, atoms of nitrogen and sulfur that we see in the proteins and the nucleic acids, they give them their specific properties. But these are the building blocks of life. So we call them the biological macromolecules, which means we're basically, human beings are made up of carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So we're going to describe each of these briefly and give you some examples. So carbohydrates are known as sugars. These are where we get our quick energy. We have different types of carbohydrates. We have monosaccharides, 
disaccharides and polysaccharides. Monosaccharides are what we call the simple sugars. They're made up of one single sugar unit, and examples are glucose and fructose. Fructose is a fruit sugar. Glucose is the, the fuel for our cells that our cells use to make ATP energy, which we'll talk about a little later. But glucose and fructose are both simple sugars with one single unit, so they're called monosaccharides. Sucrose is table sugar, and lactose is the sugar we see in milk products. For example, if you're lactose intolerant, you might uh, have trouble digesting lactose, and some people get a lot of digestive upset, upset if they eat ice cream or milk products that contain lactose unless they take an enzyme called lactate that you can purchase you know, over the counter. But those are disaccharides, so they're two sugar units bonded together, and they need to be digested in order to be absorbed into our cells. So again, if we lack the enzymes sucrase and lactase, to digest these disaccharides, they end up causing a lot of digestive upset in the lower intestines. And then we have the, uh, well, let's talk about the monosaccharides first. So looking at the monosaccharides, again, they're one single sugar unit. So we can look at them in a straight chain form, or we can look at them in this ringed form. So each corner of this hexagon here is a carbon. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six carbons with hydrogens and oxygens and, hydro and other hydrogens uh, bonded to it. So there's an OH and an H bonded to each of these carbons here around the ring. And then we have a carbon out here on the end. So this has one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. So we call them a hexose. So this is a simple sugar, one single sugar unit. Disaccharides, again, are monosaccharides, two monosaccharides bonded together. So if I take glucose and fructose and I form a covalent bond between them, between them I form sucrose, which is a disaccharide. And in the, in the formation of this bond, I release a hydrogen from one molecule and an, and an OH from the other, or hydroxide, to form water. So we see water gets kicked out as this bond is formed between these two monosaccharides. So we have a disaccharide. And then polysaccharides are long chains of glucose. And the most common uh, polysaccharides in the body are glycogen, starch, and cellulose. So animals, animal cells, which include humans, we store excess glucose in our liver and muscles in, in the form of glycogen. Glycogen is a polysaccharide. It's a long chain carbohydrate that is used to store energy. And when we're exercising or using um, excess calories and we don't have enough calories coming in, our liver and muscle cells will release glucose from these long uh, polysaccharides, from glycogen. And in plants, plants don't store excess glucose as glycogen, they store it as starch. For example, potatoes, bread, rice, pasta, those are all examples of polysaccharides we have in our diet that releases little bits of glucose bits at a time because these are long chains of glucose. So glycogen, starch, and lastly cellulose are long chains of glucose. So these are all little glucose units here bonded together for storage purposes. But cellulose is what we call roughage. Cellulose humans cannot digest in the in the digestive tract. They end up just passing through. It's, again, it's what we call roughage. It forms the, the crunchy cell walls of our vegetables that we don't digest, but it's a good source of natural fiber. But cows and termites, they have the enzymes to digest cellulose and they can eat grass and leaves and get the energy from those um, polysaccharides, but humans cannot, we cannot digest cellulose. But we can get the energy from glycogen and we also can get the energy from starch. Like we said, potatoes, rice, pasta, we can release and digest and break those bonds of those long chains of glucose. So again, polysaccharides, whether it's cellulose, starch, or glycogen, are all made of glucose. So Again, cellulose is not digestible, but it is for cows and termites. So looking at lipids, lipids are fats. They are water insoluble molecules, which means they do not dissolve in water. And you've heard the term before, water and oil don't mix. 
So when you look at the fats, there's two different versions. There's those that are solid at room temperature. Those are what we call fats. Those come from animal sources. For example, the white you see in hamburger meat or the butter that you see in the, in the refrigerator on the counter. Those are animal fats. Those are lipids. Lipids is just another name for fats and they come from animal sources. They, um, oils, on the other hand, are sources from plants. So these are lipids that are found in plants like olive oil, vegetable oil. These are um, also lipids, but they come from plant sources. So we can have saturated or unsaturated fatty acids. The ones from animal sources, these fats are typically saturated, which means they uh, increase the risk for cardiovascular disease, where unsaturated fatty acids, such as those found in oils from plants like olive oil, vegetable oil, contain unsaturated fatty acids, which lower the risk for heart disease. So when we look at what leads to blood clots, it's the fats that put us at higher risk for blood clots. So we really have to watch our intake of saturated fats, which means you know, looking at butter and animal fats like burgers and even our fatty substances like cheeses and um, dairy, you know, those high fat dairy items like ice cream. So everything in moderation. There's uh, an example here of an unsaturated fatty acid. We can see that there's double bonds in fatty acids that are the healthy fatty acids and there's single bonds in the saturated fatty acids. But together, when we see three fatty acids bonded to a glycerol, we call those triglycerides. Maybe you've heard of that. When people get their cholesterol checked, they'll get a number called their triglyceride level. And that's basically the number, or tells us the amount of fat in the blood and gives us an indication of their risk for cardiovascular disease. So we always want to watch those triglyceride levels. And we try to keep them, um, I believe it's under 130 is the number we're looking at now for um, you know, health and low risk for cardiovascular disease. And we do know that exercise is a good way of keeping those cholesterol levels under, under control. So phospholipid molecules are another type of lipid. So triglycerides are, are an example of body fat, like I said, and those um, fats that we get in our diet, fats and oils from plants, those are triglycerides. And and again, animal fat or the fat we find under our skin. Those are all lipids, but the type of lipid are triglycerides. Another type of lipid are phospholipids. Phospholipids form the cell membrane. We'll talk about that in the next unit when we talk about the cell. But this is what a phospholipid molecule looks like. And basically, it has these fatty acid tails, which are long chains of carbon, which do not dissolve in water. So if our cells have this oily barrier around them, things outside the cell can't diffuse right into the cell if they are water-soluble substances like salts and sugars and charged ions. They have to have a transporter to get through our membrane. And we'll talk more about that in the next chapter. But just be aware that phospholipids, the job of a phospholipid is to form that cell membrane. So it's, a, it's all of our cell membranes have this fatty outer covering to provor, provide protection and to keep those contents inside the cell inside so they don't end up leaking out into the extracellular fluid. Another type of lipid are steroids. Examples of steroids are the sex hormones. So sex hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone are steroids. So they are the sex hormones. They determine male and female, although ma uh, males also have estrogen and females also have testosterone-like hormones. So we have both types of hormones in our bodies. But what makes one female is a predominance of estrogen, and what makes one a male is the predominance of testosterone. And again, these are examples of lipids, but the type of lipid is steroids. So steroids all contain structurally this four-ring structure. So cholesterol is a steroid. Estrogen and testosterone are also steroids, so we look for this four-ring structure and these are all lipids, and again, an example of steroid lipids. Proteins are another important molecule of life. Protein really determines the, the structure and function of our body. So 
Lipids have a number of functions. They're for cushion and they form the cell membranes like we said and they also are these important sex hormones but proteins are really the, the main structure of the body. Our hair is made of protein, our muscle is protein, and our bones are made of protein. Particularly collagen is the, is the most abundant protein in the body and um, they form uh, connective tissues as well, ligaments and tendons. So we have this connective tissue and these important building structures of muscle and bone that are all examples of proteins. And amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So amino acids, many amino acids bonded together with peptide bonds forms what we call a protein. So when you think of the structure of the body, it's proteins that form most of the structure. Again, they're linked together by a special type of covalent bond called peptide bonds. So when you look at types or examples of proteins, uh, we looked at examples of lipids, which were, we said, triglycerides, phospholipids, and steroids. So there's three different classes of lipids. There's different types of proteins as well. There's structural proteins, which we said were muscle, bone, hair, and the different connective tissues found in ligaments and tendons. But there's also enzymes. Enzymes speed up chemical reactions, and they are important proteins used throughout the body for metabolism. So our metabolism would not exist if we didn't have enzymes to allow those reactions to occur at body temperature. Body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, but the energy required for most of the metabolic reactions is a lot higher than that, and we would need much higher temperatures for metabolism to occur. But because we have these enzymes, they lower the energy required and they lower the temperature necessary for these chemical reactions so that they can occur at 98.6. So if a person has a very high fever then, that would destroy these enzymes and the chemical reactions would break down and then the body would die. Particularly the nervous system is very sensitive to temperature changes and high fevers can result in seizures. So when you look at the enzymes, they have sometimes helping enzymes, which we call cofactors or coenzymes, which are the different uh, minerals and vitamins we see in our diet, like iron, copper, B vitamins, C vitamin, or vitamin C. Those are all helping our metabolism, helping those enzymes to do their job. So here we can see that enzymes have very specific shapes. They characterize chemical reactions based on the shape of the molecule that they're interacting with. And then when they're done with the reaction, the enzyme is used over and over again. So we don't need high amounts of these enzymes. So they're found in small amounts because they can be used over and over again. And they're not changed by the reaction either. They maintain their shape. So again, they can be used over and over again. Nucleic acids are another type of organic molecule and DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. The difference between these two nucleic acids is the sugar involved and one of the nitrogen bases that each has that's unique to that particular nucleic acid. So we'll talk about that. But when you look at the term genes, genes are simply segments of DNA. So DNA is what makes up our chromosomes and what makes up our genetic code. And all the traits that we possess are coded for by segments of DNA that we call genes. So when you hear the word genes, you're thinking small pieces of DNA that code for specific traits. So nucleic acids are made up of nucleotides. Those are the repeating units that make up DNA, which is a five carbon sugar, a nitrogen base, and a phosphate group. So this is a nucleotide. This is the building block of a DNA molecule. We have a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogen base. So if we look at the difference between DNA and RNA, the sugar is different. The sugar in DNA is called deoxyribose. The sugar in RNA is called ribose. And these nitrogen bases they contain are roughly the same except for RNA contains uracil and D DNA contains thymine. So there's a different in, difference in one of those nitrogen bases forming the structure of these molecules. RNA has uracil, DNA has thymine. RNA is single-stranded and DNA is double-stranded. 
That's another major difference between these two nucleic acids. So if I look at RNA, it's a single-stranded molecule. Again, we have a phosphate, a sugar, a nitrogen base. The C here stands for cytosine. <clears throat> we have a phosphate, sugar, nitrogen base. The A stands for adenine, sugar, I'm sorry, phosphate, sugar, nitrogen base. This is guanine, the G. And the U stands for uracil. So we just see the string of nucleotides bonded together to form RNA. It's single-stranded. DNA is double-stranded, so I see the phosphate, the sugar, and the nitrogen base adenine, but it's hydrogen bonded to another nucleotide on the other side, which again is a phosphate, a sugar, the nitrogen base thymine, and they're hydrogen bonded. So DNA looks like a ladder. It has these phosphates and sugars along the side, and it has the nitrogen bases in the middle serving as the rungs of the ladder. And we always find that adenine always bonds with thymine and cytosine always bonds with guanine. So these nitrogen bases are pairs in the sense that they are complementary to one another, that whenever I have an A, the other side of the strand is going to be a T and vice versa. The same with cytosine and guanine. C and G always pair together. So a special nucleotide um, that is in its own category is ATP. It stands for adenosine triphosphate. So it's a special molecule that has these three phosphates bonded together and there's energy in those phosphates, those bonded, I'm sorry, the bond between the phosphates. So we call ATP because it has this high energy bond between the phosphates. We call uh, this molecule, we describe it as being the energy currency of cells. Cells will take a phosphate from ATP and use it as fuel to open up a channel, to move a protein. Um, there's numerous examples we're going to talk about this semester, but it's all about ATP. So if you think about our bodies and the energy we bring in, we bring it in in the form of glucose, but we use that glucose to make ATP. And we'll talk about that process this semester. But for right now, just know that ATP is the energy currency of the cell. It's what our cells actually use to get energy. So if gas in a gas tank was the ATP, the money we put into the gas tank is the glucose. So we need glucose to get the ATP to fuel our cells. And gas is the fuel, and the cell would be like your car. So ATP is the fuel that goes directly into our cells for energy. And it's all about the energy in these phosphates, between the phosphates. So if I have adenosine here, which is ribose and adenine bonded together, I have three phosphates. If I break off a phosphate, I release energy from that very high energy bond, and I can use that phosphate to bind to some other cellular structure and give that energy. <clears throat> so whenever I'm taking a phosphate and I'm adding another, I'm storing energy, and if I'm taking off phosphates, I'm releasing energy. So that is a summary of the major organic molecules in the body, as well as a review of basic chemistry. And this concludes week one lecture, and you'll have a quiz covering chapters one and two.